Mm-hmm. Clear this be. I'm listening to that kid's my goat. Hell no, Big Anklevich! Very offensive. Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield. Welcome to another episode of That Gets My Goat. Yes. We're here uh, in the parking lot again. We've just come out of the theater having seen Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. So, if you haven't seen that, you may want to come back a little later after you have, because there there might be spoilers. There will be spoilers. We're going to spoil the shit out of this thing. That's really all we're here for, is to tell you how it ends. But, um... Yondu dies. <clears throat> just wanted to get that out of Oh, there. wow. You just went right after it. I had to, yeah. I felt that you were daring me to. <laughs> well, there you go. We spoiled it. The end. Good night, folks. Thanks for listening. Donate to the Patreon. To the spoiler alert. That could be a good podcast. Just You just get on and spoil every movie. It's like, we watched this movie, Yondu Dies. I don't know that that would be amusing. That's all you do, and you just keep putting out an episode every week. Oh, and each episode is a minute long? <laughs> yeah, it's just another spoiler. <laughs> I can guarantee you they'd have more listeners than us. <laughs> but the Paint Dry podcast actually has more listeners than us, and I I, I don't really get it. I mean, Because sometimes they won't even talk. They'll just be like, okay, They'll just watch it. let's watch. <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. This has a different style of a title than anything that I can think of in recent memory. They just called it Volume 2 as though the other one was called Volume 1. <laughs> but it's in reference to the cassette. The cassette that he got at the end of the first movie that was Volume 2. Awesome Mix Volume 2. There you go. Okay. I dig on that. Did you like the awesome mix this time around? Sure, I, I certainly did. There was one song in the end credits that I didn't like, and that that was it. Was it the one that uh, was called? I think the the names of the songs came up, and there was one that was just called Guardian, like Guardians in Inferno. Yeah, was it that one or was it no? The one it was the one before it? that, the funky one. Yeah, the the Guardians Inferno was you know deliberately disco-y and retro and. I yeah, thought that was cute. It was. Uh, I didn't realize it wasn't a real song, but I should have. I don't know. I'm not as familiar with the music from the first Guardians of the. I'm. It's hard to be familiar with any music, guys, nowadays. Um, I'm, when I meant music, I'm sorry. It's. It's hard to be familiar with, uh, with the score. I mean, songs. Yeah, I can. I can be familiar with those, and even if I didn't know them, if they were in the first Guardians of the Galaxy, now I know them. But, yeah, I guess that was like a discified version of the Guardians of the Galaxy theme. But because I didn't recognize the theme, I didn't Oh, yeah, I, I didn't know Guardians even had a theme. They did play a lot of score as the movie went on. I, I, I didn't I was... notice any score. It was always <laughs> pop songs from 40 years ago. I was asking you this because we had, what, three, four trailers? Each one of them had some kind of throwback song from like the 70s or the 60s I don't think we even had one as modern as the 80s in any of the uh, the trailers it's become like you know the new thing that you have to do is have some throwback song and that yeah Wonder Woman was the only one that didn't do it and yeah. that's set in the 1920 19 teens so yeah they, they could have pulled out uh some really old jazz staple. <laughs> Scott Joplin or something is playing. <laughs> um, Some ragtime. But yeah, I, I, I leaned over and asked you, is was it Guardians that started this trend? Or was it because of how well Suicide Squad did, basically based on the strength of their trailers? Because the movie itself wasn't that great. But it still did pretty well. And it seemed like so much of the interest for the movie was all built on the trailers and they had a ballroom blitz trailer and they had the uh, bohemian rhapsody bohemian rhapsody trailer and i think you know bohemian rhapsody was the first one which really got people into it and then after that they had the ballroom blitz one which was pretty good too and just made people think oh yeah this is gonna be good 
And yeah, we just saw it in trailer after trailer. They just... I've complained in the past that trailers are also cookie cutter and samey. And now we've got this... Because, yeah, when the Guardians trailer came out, it was unlike anything we had seen. I just... I remember you responding to it more than I'd ever seen you respond to a trailer. And a bunch of people must have felt that way. But now to find out that everything is that is just a bummer. Yeah, I mean, that's what happens. Something is successful and good and everybody just copies it, I guess. To the point where when this movie started out and they were playing, what was it, Brandy? Okay. Is that what the song was called? That started the movie, yeah, all right. And then they played another song... And then in the background, you heard, like, uh, not Stevie Nicks, uh, Fleetwood, Fleetwood Mac's Mac. song. And then in the background, you heard another song. And then they played another song. And then it, it felt, I started to want to complain and be like, oh, my gosh, this is just like, like Suicide, Suicide Squad, Squad, where they had song after song after song. And it was just so annoying at a certain point. You're just like, dude, guys, you're, you're, over, you're totally overdoing it. Although not as badly as Suicide Squad. No, yeah, no, it wasn't like that, but just I noticed it more, I guess, because it's to the point where it's already overdone. They're only on their sequel. It's only the second Guardians movie, and already so many people have copied them that it's becoming annoying. It's becoming uh, the thing that you're, you're fed up with. Interesting how quick that, that can happen. But in movie, they had an excuse for it because that dang cassette kept getting played. And then apparently there was a third cassette that the director's brother was listening to in, in a scene. And yeah, I, I don't know. They just they, they asked if <laughs> there were any of Quill's music on board. And there was. So, But, but I'm just saying that like, like and then Rocket got the had Zoom. Yeah. With 300 songs. But a Zune wouldn't necessarily have the music from right. Peter's mother's era. Exactly. Just, yeah, the fact that there was that Cat Stevens of... song on there was fortuitous, but... <laughs> I would just... assume it would have a bunch of freaking... It's like uh, Bloodhound M Gang? sync <laughs> Oh, okay. <'cause> that... <laughs> that was about the last time people were listening to a Zune. <laughs> Anyways... Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I I haven't heard the soundtrack yet. Like Awesome Mix Volume 1, that thing, I mean, my then 13, 12-year-old daughter got that and listened to it incessantly. Which, I don't know, it seems strange to me. To It was good stuff, though. Yeah, but still, it's it, a lot of it was like soft rock hits from the 70s. Right. That just seems weird for a 12-year-old to be like listening to constantly 30 years later listening to if you like pina colada and getting caught in the rain etc yeah this time around there was a lot of songs and i would say they went through like a, yeah i'd never heard that brandy song uh there was a lot of songs they went through before i finally was like oh okay uh, i've at least heard that one before you hadn't heard the fleetwood well you know it was the fleetwood, fleetwood mac one i recognized that was the but the, the elo one, one the mr blue sky you hadn't heard probably not the one that played during the opening credits oh i loved that there were opening credits and there were in the, there were in the first one too the first guardians remember he was dancing and he kicking the little mon creatures and you used one as a microphone uh -huh. the opening credits were fun to watch uh, Groot do the dance but yeah what would you give an overall rating did you enjoy this movie would you a thumbs up um yeah oh, definitely it was a good movie but I, I liked the first of it quite a bit not so much the middle and then I thought the ending was super super strong but I, I don't know. There was some, okay, I guess if I have to identify it, it is the problem of all modern sequels. It was just too effing big. Too much stuff going on. Too huge. We had, oh, we got to top that last one. Oh, they threw everything but the kitchen sink at you. Whereas the stuff that I responded to, the stuff that spoke to me was character stuff and intimate stuff it didn't have anything to do with explosions and you know cutting from planet to planet to planet to see what what's happening you know the whole 
galaxy getting destroyed and stuff like that. It's just, I, I've complained about it a lot of times and you've complained about it. They always feel like they have to one up the movie before. And the only way they know to one up is to make it bigger with more explosions and more special effects. Gosh, it would just be so neat if there was a movie like Wrath of Khan that came out where it's like, yeah, we've got no budget at all. So we're going to have to make this one like super personal and like limited sets. And oh gosh, what, how are we going to do this? And they ended up accidentally making the greatest of all the Star Trek movies. It, I mean, it can be done, but nobody wants to do it because if your first movie was successful enough to warrant a sequel, then of course you're going to spend the money. You're going to have the money. Right. Yeah, there was a lot of times in this movie where it felt a lot like a Star Wars prequel. The backgrounds were entirely animated. Was there a set? I don't. I, I think that it was one of those where it was like all the guys just standing around on a green screen set that they walked around on, and I don't know. There was just too much of that green screen looking to it. I would have really appreciated something that felt more real. And there was a few times where they just went so over the top with things. Especially with the Rocket Yondu sequences. When Yondu When they're killing the like 250 guys and, at the same time. And yeah, and, and he's just sending his arrow all over the place. And it was just so stylized. There was several times in this show where it was just like, walk out in slow motion, here we go. And a lot of times it didn't make sense that they were doing that either. You know, generally that's, uh, okay, the badasses are off to do their thing. But they did it like when Drax and Quill and Gamora leave the crashed ship to get on... The ship with his dad. Just like, let's walk in slow motion. With cool music playing. To another ship. And then get in and sit down and fly somewhere. It's like, let's do slow-mo while we get on the airplane. Yeah, it was like the Sovereign send a thousand ships. And when the Ravagers arrive to take our heroes, they send a thousand guys. And when Yondu is killing the Ravagers, yeah, there apparently there are still a thousand guys in that ship that has to have to die. And yeah, then you just cut from planet to planet to planet and all that stuff for the special effects and the sequences. And, and when the, the ego planet is falling apart or whatever, it was just a sensory overload so much stuff just being thrown at you and whereas just I I, I would have responded more if I cared more if I if we were focusing on something so I could follow the action I mean it it wasn't Star Wars prequels where it's just like wow this is just that's all this is is special effects I still cared yeah this the story but, wasn't that bad it just had the edge to it you know just that that little bit too much the story itself was good, and there was a lot of really interesting character stuff that went on. And we had a lot of story going on with each character to where, you know, there was a lot uh, that happened in this movie, and I really enjoyed it. But, yeah, it's just that touch too much that you get sometimes, especially in space movies these days, it seems. That's the one that they, they just can't help themselves, but... Got to make it a crazy, cool, neato planet. And space is never black. <laughs> I don't know why, but everything is... There, there's so many nebulas out there. And I am getting older. I keep mentioning that to you over and over and over. And, and life keeps mentioning it to me. But it just may be that the sensibilities that I responded to are passe now and that it's going more and more to this frenetic not only does everybody have to have some subplot but every cast member has to have their own action sequence and it's, they've got to do something to impress the millennials who have seen it all 
And it's like, okay, well, you know, if you throw enough stuff, but like when, when Star-Lord and his father had the Superman fight, I just started to mentally check out. Yeah. I I don't know. It's, I, I stopped being emotionally involved in the story because as it just became too much. It became grandiose. It became, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to compare it to Man of Steel because they didn't fight for an hour. It just, yeah, it was... Uh, and, uh, also, <laughs> when you could absolutely, you could actually destroy Ego, his body, completely, and then it just reformed, just like, oh, okay, well... Yeah, what's the point of the Superman fight in the end? And I guess the point of it was keep him distracted so that we can get the bomb planted on his actual brain and blow him up but I just I wish it had been a little bit more intimate a little bit smaller because the stuff that was intimate when characters were talking to each other and like the the shit with Nebula and Gamora and just you know the hate and that and then it sort of becomes not hate that really spoke to me and the stuff with with Rocket coming to terms with who he is and, and bonding with Yondu. And, and then, and yeah, the stuff with Yondu being Quill's real dad, you know, not not his father, but his his dad. I, I, all that stuff worked for me. But it was just like the grandiose, gigantic special effects stuff that didn't. And so, yeah, I, I probably... Eventually we're going to get to a point where every movie is like that. And I'll be like, gosh, couldn't I have just gone in a room somewhere and talked? <laughs> and people are like, oh boy, Grandpa, talked. Yeah, I think that's what we're going to be like here soon. Pretty soon we're going to stop bothering with these superhero movies and just start reviewing the Jane Austen adaptations and the the musicals. <laughs> Because, uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe we're just getting old, too old for these kind of things. They had a trailer for The King's Men Part 2. Yeah. And you told me about how you saw The King's Men Part 1 and it made you feel old. Made me feel like I had a, a three-foot-long white beard, yeah. There, there are movies, and they're aimed at youth, I guess, and I just, I know that I'm not that anymore, even though I feel... Like a youth, a lot of times, just sad. I, fewer and fewer, but they feel like they have to throw so much at the audience. Like everybody is is so ADD that they're not able to focus on just two people having a conversation or bonding or becoming enemies or somebody learning something about somebody else. It really does sound like I'm the guy that's like, why well, only see independent movies? <laughs> Someday we will, because that'll be the only place you could find that stuff. The movies where they don't have a gajillion dollars to spend on special effects. But somebody, yeah, somebody the other day mentioned, oh, did you know that that Transformers: The Last Night takes place in medieval times? And I was like, it does, really? Oh, I'd like to. S- oh. No, never mind. It's a Transformers movie. And it just, the mindset, well, what's the word I'm looking for? The the whole thought behind the Transformers movie. The, there's a word I'm looking for. The, that is not for me. That is not intended the for me. Bay experience. The, the, there's no possible chance for me to enjoy one of those, even though I was just like, "Wow, a Transformers movie set in medieval times." It, so what? So Optimus becomes, well, he still becomes a semi truck. Oh, okay. Well, f you. But thank you for. for <laughs> it's me- actually just one of those medieval times restaurants that it's ah, set in. Okay, well that works. And they do like the jousting show for everybody that has to eat with their hands because they don't give you any forks. <laughs> So it, may, it makes more sense that he still transforms into a truck. Okay, well, the, there's that. And, I mean, that's a bad example. He because transforms they're... into a horse and cart. Oh, see, that would be pretty neat. <laughs> I mean, it's like, wow, why does the horse have a thousand moving parts and little wearing belts and cogs and, and all that? Well, because Michael Bay still had something to do with this movie, even though it takes place in 1791. Or, sorry, it would have been... I was going to say, that's not very medieval. No, I, well, you said horse and cart, so I... 
I thought of, you know, Old West or something like that. But yeah, I mean, the Transformers are the absolute worst example of those. But there is a youth-targeted mindset of just flash and quickly and moving and cuts and go to the next thing and explosions that has passed me by. Sorry, guys, I don't care how spectacular your action sequence is. If I don't care about the people in the action sequence, then I don't care about the action sequence. You know, the action sequence is just a cartoon anyway, so... I saw better action sequences between Roadrunner and Bugs Bunny. I mean, Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote. Oh. <laughs> Back when they were just cartoons as well. So, I mean, you get the same stuff. You can't be wowed by special effects when you know that there's nobody actually involved in it. You know what I mean? The days of wowing people with special effects are over. You never, you don't go and say, wow, the special effects were so good. You know, like Independence Day, people did that. They came out saying, oh my gosh, they blew up the White House. And you see, it was, it was so amazing. But people don't do that anymore. And they haven't done it for like at least 10 years. Somebody needs to realize that in Hollywood and move along. But we still have movies like uh, Geostorm. Where it's like, that movie, that is still being made? It's like, from the makers of The Day After Tomorrow and 2012. No kidding. From the makers. It was those movies. <laughs> but but there is an entire segment of the population that hasn't seen Independence Day or any of those movies. And and they all speak Chinese. And they, they need the spectacle. They want that, all, that stuff. Yeah, maybe and that's the problem. Maybe the fact that we weren't a united world back then like the, we are now as far as movie going at least goes but you have to care about the people that the wave or the hail storm or the tornado or whatever it is is are going to wipe out or are threatening because if you don't care you just watch the special effects you watch the cartoon it's been a long time since you saw special effects that were so amazing that that's what you focused on. Avatar was the, probably the last one that I can think of where you're just like, wow, my gosh, special effects were astounding. Yeah. And dude. that one only counted because it was 3D. If it hadn't been 3D, it wouldn't have been astounding. It would have been, oh, yeah, those were, that was nice. But, you know, I mean, you get back from the grave Peter Cushing and, and Carrie Fisher in Rogue One, and it's like, guys, you would have been better off to not have done that at all. Yep. It's like special effects did not help me connect with that movie, but quite the opposite. Please just let's focus. Let's let's pour <laughs> some of this budget, one percent of the budget, into the screenplay. Can we do that? Yeah. And I, I'm sorry. It sounds like I, I thought that Guardians was terrible. It wasn't. It just it was too much. There was too much stuff going on, and you know it inter introduced a ton of new characters. But except for Ego, you really don't get enough time with those characters. And even Ego, I just... there was It moved too fast. I was like, what? Okay, cause, so he, he's just met him, and now he's bonding with him, and now he's betrayed by him. But I never really... I mean, like the scene where Star-Lord's eyes get all... Galaxified. Galaxi Galaxified, yeah. That scene is so short, you never for a second feel like, oh, well, he's going to abandon his friends. He's going to, you know, he's going to go over to the dark side. I, I assume that's what they were trying to set up is some tension in the audience of, oh, gosh, is he, ooh, is he becoming corrupted? But it, it was too fast. Yeah, there could have been a few more scenes before they uh, finished that off. I did like uh, the other new character that they introduced was the empath girl with the little... Mantis? Yeah, things on her forehead. I found her to be fun. She wasn't a deep character. No, she was really cool. I, yeah, I didn't mean to slight her. They gave her a fair amount to do as far as uh, talking with people and, you know, a little bit of, hey, this isn't what you think it is. Which you knew it wasn't. <laughs> I don't know. It's just one of those things. But those scenes, like with her bonding with Drax 
that's what I'm going to remember from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the things where I was engaged those are the things where i was delighted when i was feeling something and i started to think are, are those two gonna be are, is there are they setting up a love story here I, I i couldn't tell and and then at the end you know he has that delightful line where he says and you know you are beautiful too on the inside <laughs> <laughs> i just that was really strong <clears throat> i don't know i starting to think that there is not a movie out there that couldn't be improved by cutting the budget in half. Yeah, that's probably true. And we're about to get hit by the onslaught of these movies coming one after the other. Next week is King Arthur meets Game of Thrones mm. with a gigantic budget and insane CG sets. I, I just can't see that connecting to it with an audience I, I, yeah i don't know who's gonna want to see that maybe it'll be huge in the uk well okay that's cool but I that's where that's king gonna... arthur didn't live so yeah <laughs> i don't think that that's going to save it unfortunately because the uk is it's a nice it's... big country but it takes a whole world these days to make up for a budget like that and then immediately after that there is shoot what was the next one well, I don't know. Is it Alien Covenant? Yeah, that's it. It's the Alien Covenant, which is going to be another gigantic budget one. And then right after that is Pirates of the Caribbean f- five. 5. Which, weirdly, I've heard seen no. Yeah. Like, almost, I think today may have been the first time I saw anything like a commercial or anything like that. Oh, so you saw a commercial? I still, yeah. It's, it, I don't know what the deal is. They, those movies cost so much money that Disney has to feel pressured to spend two or three hundred million dollars in the marketing and then uh, immediately after that is Wonder Woman and then yeah I don't know, it keeps going from there and I don't, I'm not interested in any of them Wonder Woman I'd like to see which I don't know I feel weird wanting to see that <laughs> just because I know it's just going to follow in the tradition of all the other DC movies and just be like dark and depressing. Although the trailers don't make it look like that. The Suicide Squad trailer, I guess, didn't make it look like that either. But I guess we'll see how it goes. Well, Wonder Woman shouldn't be dark and depressing. I mean, I... I agree, but that just, doesn't mean... Neither should Superman. Not, oh, that's true. I mean, yeah, Wonder Woman... doesn't mean I, they're not going to do Wonder it. Wonder Woman has more room for dark and depressing than Superman. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't even get my hopes up for any of these it's like they haven't earned any f- good faith from me at all and and I'm one of the people that didn't hate suicide squad as fraught with flaws as it was but I just yeah you asked me the other day if, was, if there was any chance I was going to go see wonder woman and sure I'll I mean if if you want to go see it I'll go see it with you but my guess is it's going to be mediocre. It's not going to be so crappy that we're glad we went to see it because we can make fun of it. But, <laughs> but it has to be, be great. Either. It has to be good. Maybe it, maybe it has to be great. I don't know. It's just like you really care about this Wonder Woman character. I mean, she means something to you and that raises the bar. You can't just make a mediocre movie. And, and apparently 51% of the world has all their hopes resting in the bosom of Wonder Woman. It's like, wow, that's a lot of pressure. I, I hope you guys don't make just a really bad movie or a mediocre movie or a half-assed movie because apparently it, it's more than just a movie. It's a statement of... It's it's a Virginia Slims ad, you know? And, and, and this is where... You know, modern feminism has gotten us. Now we are here at, at 2017 when a female-led, giant-budget superhero movie is coming out. And, and it can't just be a movie. It has it. It's a statement and a barometer of, of where we stand. And it's, Sorry, I feel like I'm going on and on. I, <laughs> but I, I've heard so many people say that. You know, it's like, oh, it's about time. 2017, boy. Should have been 1917 when the Wonder Woman movie came out. And... It was set in 1917, if it makes him feel any better. No, it makes me feel better. (laughs) I know that this is not part of the narrative, but 
Catwoman came out not too long ago. Yeah. And Supergirl came out. In 1984. And Wonder Woman had her own TV show. Yeah, Electra. I saw Electra, Electra in the theater, kids. But for some reason, Those this is the forgotten. first female superhero movie Why are ever. They all forgotten? I don't understand. Is it just because they were terrible? <laughs> Although the Wonder Woman That's TV show, I don't know that I, I haven't seen it since it was new, but I loved it when I saw it. I'm sure I was a child then, so maybe that's not fair. But oh man, I loved the Wonder Woman TV show. I found it to be way superior to the Batman TV show, and at least in my particular case, I liked it more than the Incredible Hulk TV show. Incredible Hulk TV show tended to be a little bit of a downer. Maybe it was just that sad music that <laughs> ROA2T used to always play. Yeah, I liked. And maybe it's just because I have a never ending crush on Linda Carter that just won't go away, but I liked that show. So it makes me sad to see it discounted. Anyways, yeah, there, the reason I got us off onto this tangent was just saying that one after the other after the other movies coming up is expected to be more of the same but worse. I don't I mean this show this movie was good. I liked it a lot. I enjoyed it. There were some times when it was over the top where it was too much, but in general it was a good movie. But King Arthur and Pirates of the Caribbean and Alien Resurrection I don't expect those to be good at all. What about Transformers The Last Night? Transformers The Last Night will be a triumph of modern cinema. Oh, okay. As okay. everyone, I'm sure, expects. We used to have pretty... Uh, maybe it was because we would go and see one, and then we would talk like this for like an hour, and then we would divide it up into four episodes. <laughs> I was going to say, we used to have like all summer long, that gets my goats, one after the other after the other, which is about a movie, but maybe we didn't see more movies before than we do now. It seems like we were a little broader in our scope back in the day, and, and that has narrowed down to where basically... It's just the superhero movies? Yeah, it's just not even the superhero movies, it's just the Marvel movies, because DC let us down so much that we barely go to see those even. We don't see the Superman or the Superman v. Batmans. We did see Suicide Squad, and we probably will see Wonder Woman. Justice League, are we going to see that? When you that will, I'm out? not going to. Uh, November, I believe. November? I don't know. I guess we do Star Wars now, because they started coming out with movies, but we don't even do Pixar anymore. We used to do Pixar, but Pixar sure is not... we did quick. Finding Nemo. Finding, Finding Dory. Whatever it's called. Yeah, you forced me to go to Finding Dory. Okay. Well, <laughs> well Finding Dory was had that same kind of stuff going on as Guardians of the Galaxy 2. I... I Although I liked Guardians a lot more than Finding Dory, it just, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's so easy to do special effects. It's so easy to do action and, seek and and explosions and all that stuff. And the personal thing and, and caring and being worried about our characters, that is all hard. I don't know. I, the, there was the Spider-Man trailer we saw, and it was the first time I had seen that. And, yeah, okay, I'm sure there's tons of action sequences in him fighting the Vulture in that trailer, but I don't remember any of that. All I remember is the the personal stuff, the Peter Parker stuff, the, the Iron Man telling him, you know, he's got to take off the suit, he can't be, you know, and, and him webbing together this fairy that's been torn in two, you know, trying to save all these people, and it's just like, wow, I, that's going to be a really good movie. Now, I don't know that it is, but that's the voice in the back of my head when I saw that trailer saying, you want to see that? And it's because they, they had enough of that in the trailer of, you know, you're going to care. You're going to care about this kid and he's going to have some hard times, and but he's got a good attitude and you're going to have fun. And yeah, just seeing him hang out with Tony Stark again, it gets me excited. So there's that, you know, I mean, the last Spider-Man movie was so bad yeah. yet here we are here here i am saying wow oh opening weekend i'm gonna see that thing yeah well you trust the people behind it a lot more than you did before that's true and they were smart enough to bring him in in civil war 
so that we're invested in this Spider-Man already. And that, yeah, I, I think it'll do well, and I, I hope that it's as good as that trailer was. Yeah. There's very few that are as good as their trailer anymore. When does that Mummy movie come out that, that we saw the trailer for? Is that this summer? Uh, yeah, sometime in, like, July this or something This part like of that. the uh, Universal Monsters... The, yeah, the Universal Cinematic Monster Universe. <laughs> And they keep not saying who Tom Cruise is. It seems like, what, is that a uh, twist that's coming at the end of the movie? And is it, he's Van Helsing? Yeah. Or? It's interesting that, that they don't give that away right there at the... But yeah, that, that movie is just so many special effects. And there were a couple of special effects where I was just like, oh, hey, that's kind of interesting. When, when she had four eyeballs... Yeah, that was in the first trailer. But, you know, it's just like tons of spiders and tons of rats and tons of bats and stuff like that. And I was just like, oh, that's kind of cool. But, yeah, all of the... She can turn into the, the wind and, you know, and, and, and all that stuff. None of that even remotely spoke to me. I don't know why. It's just, I guess we've seen it before. There were at least three of those mummy movies so recently. Plus the Scorpion you know, King. Or plus whatever, the Scorpion the King and was. Scorpion King prequel and a Scorpion King sequel. And yeah, the, this mummy just looks like a cg -er one. And I remember how much CG was in that 1999 Stephen Summers one. But it just I'm trying to think if there was a single moment in that trailer where I cared about anybody. And then maybe you weren't supposed to. Maybe it was a just spectacle. Well, I should ask you what you thought of that mummy trailer because I... I don't know, maybe I, you got a completely different... It didn't thing. look interesting to me at all, I'm afraid. It looked... Uh, it was like uh, all the trailers, I guess. Every single one of them was just, look, here's an explosion, and here's a thing that, you know, somebody would not survive happening to them. <laughs> oh, here's another thing that someone wouldn't survive, and they, oh, look, they just did it anyways because they're freaking superhuman. There was a fair amount of that in the Guardians of the Galaxy, even where like people things happen to them, and I'm just like, oh, how are they all? Are right? they so uh, broken bones at least? Or I mean, at the end they had a joke where the arrow just shoots into Drax's chest, and he's just like ah, and the guy just kind of like walks away, and it's just like this is funny. He just shot Drax like in the heart with his freaking. This is the guy that we. <laughs> he's one of our heroes and we're just going to end the movie on him being shot in the heart with an arrow and screaming in pain I don't Ugh. there was a shot where they uh, they all jumped out of like their, their crashing spaceship and dropped 50 feet and all of them were fine they landed on their feet yeah like they, they landed on their feet even Mantis who was just like not a action Athlete person yeah she was a person who was like freaking homeschooled her whole life <laughs> and yet she just dropped out of the sky and landed on her feet she didn't even like fall and have to roll or something she just dropped and landed yeah there was a fair amount of that kind of stuff where just you know sorry but human beings can't do that kind of stuff dude those people would be in physical therapy for years to get over what would happen to them if those things really happened and so it makes me wonder. I mean, I don't know the Guardians of the Galaxy outside of the movies and like a little bit of like cartoon stuff that has happened since. So I don't know. Are they superhuman? I mean, obviously it turned out Star Lord was until he blew up the planet, I guess, and now he's not again. Is Drax? I mean, he's some kind of a different kind of an alien. Is he? He's superhuman, but we saw him get his head handed to him in that first movie. Ronan just wiped the floor with Drax. And I was like, oh, wow, okay. And, and yeah, he felt really human, even though he's a tough guy. But yeah, like the stuff that Gamora did in this movie tops anything that any of the, the Guardians did in the first movie, I would say. I mean, she was able to do stuff that wire foo <laughs> uh, martial artists can't do. <laughs> I mean, she's the daughter of Thanos, so I assume she's superhuman. Peter Quill, I guess he's sort of superhuman with all the... I mean, he's half celestial. So you think that all of that went away once the planet was destroyed? So he's not going to be able to make energy with his hands and make a ball? Well, that's what... Yeah, that's what they said. 
was would happen. He even said that right at the end. He said, if you kill me, then you're not going to be this special anymore. And he said, what's wrong with that? Mm. So I assume okay. that, that will be gone. But uh, some of it, I would assume, has to linger. I don't know. He's He's tougher than your average bird anyway. Well, yeah, I guess they, they explained that he held a, an infinity stone in the first movie and didn't die. And yeah, they explained that at the very end. The, the, the doctors checked him out, and there's something else in his DNA. You know, he's not entirely human. But uh, the celestial thing was interesting. I, I, I did not... Going into this movie, I didn't know who the bad guy was going to be. We'd seen this, the golden woman on like a, a couple of posters, so I assumed, oh, okay, maybe she's the villain. And yeah, up until... <laughs> he is revealed up until Mantis says, I need to tell you something. I didn't realize that he was going to be our villain. I, yeah. I guess I'm just thick. Yeah, I guess I should have expected that too. But for some reason, I just thought, oh, wow, they're giving him a father. Isn't that nice? But yeah, I was. it's funny because I was a little frustrated because I was trying to avoid spoilers. And, you know, in working in news, that's kind of hard because we do stories about movies when they come out. And we do the the package where the guy's talking, oh, yeah, and this is the new, and here's what the stars have to say about it. And, and this happens. And, yeah, one of the things that I saw was Kurt Russell saying, I'm your father. And I thought, oh, crap. Oh, you didn't even know that. I didn't want to know that that was coming. Of course, it happened really early on. So, well, that they show the first scene is young Kurt Russell. Yeah, yeah. So I would assume that spoiled for you right there at the beginning. There's no spoiling. Right. Yeah, I didn't realize that it wasn't a big reveal or something like that at the end or whatever. For some reason, I just I was irritated. I was like, "Oh, you guys spoiled it! I'm gonna kill you!" But they didn't was right off the top so it wasn't that big of a deal but yeah i guess we've said our piece about this show it's yeah well if you want to say more i can come up with more i just i don't want to be just oh now let's nitpick for the next 20 minutes i when a movie has this much weight on its shoulders it can't help but be a little bit disappointing yeah the first guardians of the galaxy came out of nowhere and I remember yeah, everybody Marvel expected Studios it to be a failure, their first failure. Well, Marvel Studios had so much confidence in it that they announced a sequel before the first one came out. And I was just like, what to Guardians of the Galaxy? He's like, I'm a comic book fan. And I couldn't tell you who the Guardians of the Galaxy are. I, wow, really? And remember they were all afraid of the movie with a, a walking tree and a talking raccoon? Our our audience is going to accept this? And it was so good, and the word of mouth spread so much. There was like, wow, and, and I know a lot of people that that is their favorite of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah. But then, cut three years into the future, you have to measure up to that. And the expectations are automatically higher. I don't know how you do that, except for, you know, in the script. You work extra, extra hard, and... And I could see what they were doing. You know, they gave everybody something to do. Everybody had their own subplot and their own arc of some sort. And I thought that that was cool. Uh, but then, you know, they've got other fingers in the in the pie saying, okay, well, we also need a ton more explosives and we need a ton more songs. The first movie <laughs> sold all of these soundtracks, so we need to do that again. And, and we need more ships. Uh, yeah. Just... <laughs> I did love the... The gold people's ships where they're like, he's like, yeah, I just killed him. We just blew him up. And he's like, there's nobody in those. Those are remotely piloted. And then it cuts to them flying them. And what? And they had like the sound effects. And it was basically like a little, like. It was a video perfect arcade. Perfect planet video arcade. <laughs> it was such a video arcade that it just made me chuckle. The one thing that I didn't like was the Mickey Mousing when they're having their Superman fight. And the dad turns into like a giant rock version of himself, and Peter turns into a rock version of <laughs> Pac-Man. Pac -Man, and then he goes walk 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 when he comes at him. It's like Ugh. if you just left the sound effect out, that would have been perfect. But now I'm nitpicking, so I'm gonna I'm gonna cut that out, 
and just say I liked the movie. It was a good movie. It wasn't a perfect movie. It was a little over the top. But I thought it was a pretty good for a sequel. With a lot riding on its shoulders. It, it had a hard road to hoe. And I thought it did, did pretty well with it. There was a lot of good character stuff in there that was enjoyable. I just wish that, yeah, there had been a little more of that and a little less of the bombasticness. Ooh, that's a good word. I don't know that it actually is a word. Bombastic, I think, is a word, but bombastic. How about bombacity? Ooh, that's a good word. Well, we'll end on that then. Anything we usually say at the end of these shows other than goodbye? Um, be excellent to each other. Don't say goodbye. <laughs> say good journey. I've been Rich Outfield. And I've been Big Anklevich. You are hideous. <laughs> yes, but beautiful on the inside. <laughs> Good night. See ya. That Gets My Goat is produced under Creative Commons, Alfred Jason, non-commercial, no deliveries, 3.0 license. But that will be our little secret.